today we're in the presence of uh, somebody who's had a huge impact on culture and I presume many of the, the listeners' lives. David Chase, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. How much of it would you put down to um, genius and how much would you put down to luck? <laughs> uh, genius, I don't know how to put anything down, but um, 75% luck. The right things have to line in the right places for it to happen yeah. for anybody who's kind of in the creative expression game correct and let's suppose for the sake of argument that i have talent i didn't create that that was luck do you think there's nearly also luck in what you're exposed to in life that gives you the ability to kind of put it into paper like uh, i've read that the conception of tony soprano was founded on your own relationship with your mother and therefore you propose the idea of a mobster who went to therapy um, and then it became something that went on for six seasons. Would you would you have rather had a normal childhood and, and more stability? Are you glad that you came from the background you did because it allowed you to uh, live a life that otherwise you probably wouldn't have been able to have? God, I, I just don't know how to answer that. But I, <clears throat> I will say that I, I, I did have a very happy childhood, actually. Happy and safe. Um, my mother was problematic. There's no doubt about it. And I'm not the only one that felt that way. Most cousins and aunts uh, felt that my mother was out there someplace. And you see the personality of Livia. Um, that was kind of what my mother was like. But the other day, I was in my room, and I, my bedroom, and I looked and I had placed this little statue of the Buddha on top of a cabinet. And it's a thing called the happy Buddha, which is kind of like a fat, chubby Buddha with his robe kind of opened up top and little rolls of fat. And then I remember that my mother gave me that of all people um, when I was about 14 or 15. So I don't know how to deal with that whole subject. I'm obviously from a different generation to yourself. So kind of what part of parental behavior do we put down to their personality and what element of it do we put down to the times? Like it was a very stressful time for women in general in 1950s, 1960s America in terms Mm -hmm. of nearly oppression and misogyny. So you can kind of only imagine how they must have transferred a lot of that uh, inequality in certain ways. Do you know what I mean? I suppose so. I mean, my, my, I, my father was not an oppressor. Uh, my father did not treat my mother in any particular way because she was a woman. Um, <laughs> he treated her in the way he had to because she was so out there. Um, do you mean out there as in terms of like quick to express an opinion or someone who uh, quick to express an opinion and the, the opinion would be so qu- questionable and crazy that um, but then that was constant that was just the way she was she was uh, she had uh, I forget whether it was nine or eleven sisters she had I think she had eleven siblings two of them were brothers um and they were all, all the kids in that family, my aunts and uncles, were very demonstrative, um, loud, you might say. But my mother was like none of the others. She was, um, my cousin once said that my mother was only into, into her own thoughts. And everything else, the rest of the universe, was on the periphery. And I thought that was pretty accurate. Would you have found her discouraging um, towards any kind of things you might have dreamt of? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't think she was that, that different from other kids of that era. I, you know, she had, she had gone through the Great Depression and World War II. And she had been born into 
if not poverty, certainly into a situation of lack, lack of material niceties. And I think her main concern, well, I was going to say that her main concern was that I earn enough money, but that was not, not her main concern. Her main concern was that I would wind up in a career that was something that she could be proud of. Um, because with the rest of her problems came a certain amount of narcissism. Of course, she'd be the first one to tell you that there was nothing narcissistic about her. Um, but she thought about herself and her safety con- constantly. She wanted you to be something that she could show off nearly as somebody who enjoyed a hard day's work and nearly had the struggle himself because she nearly was addicted to the concept of complaining in a way. She was addicted to the concept of complaining. She complained constantly. But what she wanted for me was to be something that was unassailably respectable, which would have been a teacher, uh, a lawyer, possibly. And then she had one friend who was in the United States Foreign Service, who was a woman, who was probably a secretary. She was not a diplomat, um, who had been all over the world. And my mother wanted that for me. What about religion? Was she was she into God? She she was, but I heard more about that in her later years than I did um, growing up. But they sent me to Sunday school, and um, but they didn't go to church. Then my mother started going to church when I was about I don't know thirteen or fourteen. Um, my father said that he was an agnostic. And you see, our family was a little bit off-center because although we're Italian-American, I mean, 100% Italian, um, we are Protestant. Um, So, you know, as a kid, I never felt, I didn't like going to church for the usual reasons. Kids don't like it. But I also didn't like it because I didn't feel like I was in the right place. And I didn't feel like all those Protestant people in the church, all those people named Smith and Jones. Mm. um, Shared your values. Liked me or my parents. Yeah, there's a classic kind of old school judgment and trying to keep the elite, the elite used by... uh, Mm -hmm. the Protestant community back in that day. And we obviously saw that in Ireland where I'm from. Um, But as you kind of enter like the the seventies and eighties now, would there be any part of you that considers a a spiritual relationship with any sort of a figure of the afterlife or are you locked in on your thoughts and kind of satisfied with the concept of of human? I'm very very unsatisfied. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm unsatisfied, but no, I'm very interested in concepts of the afterlife. In that, I would include alternate universes. Uh, I'm very interested in Buddhist conceptions of the afterlife. I'm not, you know, sort of over the idea of heaven or hell and yeah, sitting in judgment and all that shit. Yeah, so not not organized religion, but you, you definitely think there's something that we're not aware of that kind of exceeds our ability to comprehend. Most certainly. Would there be ever times when you get the dark thought that it is it is meaningless, like like everyone kind of does, and we, and we are kind of just destined for a, a consciousness of nothingness? I I used to I used to think that a lot, but lately, as I get older, maybe it's just like my mother going to church as she got older. Um, as I get older, I think a lot about uh, the origin of the universe the destiny of the universe. Um, Have you ever heard of the Holy Modal Rounders? It's a psychedelic folk group from the early 60s in Greenwich Village. And they have a song called God, What Am I Doing Here? 
And I feel that, you know, often. Everybody does. It's, you know, it's kind of a funny song. What was your relationship with the hippie movement? I didn't have much of a relationship with the, with the hippie movement. I mean, I mean, there, look, at that time, there were hippies. There were radicals. There were uh, hipsters. Um, and I didn't have any... I was totally into the music and I had no, no truck with hippies really. My, in terms of appearance and all that, the costume, it was all English as far as I was concerned. That's the look I liked. Would you have been a huge Beatles fan back in the day? Yes. And would you lean more Lennon or McCartney in terms of ideology? I know obviously they're both geniuses. I lean more, I lean more Lennon. Yeah. McCartney kind of strikes me as the great songwriter, a little bit more innocent at soul and the PR man. But Lennon's inner pain for me gives the Beatles that uh, that roughness that gives them the the widespread appeal. In the I biggest, think so. yeah, I think so. But Lennon also now strikes me as a complainer, um, and from what I've heard and what I've witnessed and movies and stuff not completely a nice guy it seems like there was a huge element of hypocrisy there but for me a guy who clearly had a a very uniquely dark relationship with the concept of love like like yeah. he never he never felt it and never really knew how to express it and that's why he kind of became the sacrificial lamb of love to, to so many people uh-huh. which what what makes a lot of great art tony soprano's kind of problem with the concept of love and nearly the guilt he felt whenever he, obviously, you know much more about this than me, but I'm just kind of saying what I think as a viewer, the guilt he nearly felt when his heart became active. Um, was that guilt. a representation of, of yourself at all? Like an actual belief that you're unlovable? I suppose so. I've never thought about it that way, but that sounds pretty accurate. Um, Tony reminded me quite a bit of my father, if that means anything. But as far as the Beatles are concerned, it's, um, I don't know. I'm, I've, I've had enough of the Beatles. You don't get any endorsements from still putting in a vinyl? I don't use vinyl anymore, unfortunately, although I'm going to start again because I just got my records back out of storage. Um not really, no. I've heard all of those songs so many times. Um, whereas I don't feel that way about the Stones, for example. Would you, would, you um, prefer, would you prefer the Rolling Stones to the Beatles? Yeah. Yes, I do. It's a debate that dominated your generation, and it's one that I envy. Because uh, we, we have nothing. I don't know if you still check out modern music, but uh, in, really. my, in my opinion, it's... Absolutely yeah. appalling. It's it's in the shit, Dave. It's terrible. It's terrible. Do you have R and B? You have what they call R and B, which has no R and no B. Mm. And, and I guess hip hop. I don't know what the shit it is. Really, uh, do you find the TVs now kind of taking on the same theme? As in, it's getting dominated by money, Netflix contracts, and the standard and the realness of the work in all these kind of series that are becoming only momentarily popular. I mean, obviously we have Mad Men and, and Breaking Bad and the anti-hero concept that The Sopranos created doing so well, but now there's like a six-week binge and these characters make no imprint into society. Do you think that, that TV is suffering the same fate as music did 20 years before? No, I, to be honest with you, I can't say because I don't watch it. I don't watch enough of it, so I really don't know. I keep telling myself I must, but I don't do it. Um, for example, Squid Game. I never even saw Squid Game. Did you watch Breaking Bad? I never watched Breaking Bad. I mean, I did watch Breaking Bad for a while, yeah. Um, the, the only shows that I really wa- really watched were shows where my friends and former um, colleagues, I watched Mad Men, I watched um, the one in Atlantic City. <laughs> it escapes my mind memory right now. Um, Boardwalk Empire. 
does working in TV nearly make you sick of it? Like you, you can't become a fan of it and sit down and enjoy it when you know the rigorous process and the labor that goes no. into it. And from the outside, do we completely glamorize the job in terms of like, is it that much better to be, obviously financially it is, but is it that much better to be the creator of The Sopranos than a plumber in terms of happiness as someone who's lived that life? Because oh, there's so many kids who want to be famous, want to be culturally impactful. You will die an icon. Has it made you happier? Boy, that's a hard one. Well, it does make... I, I loved working on the show. I enjoyed that as a creative endeavor. I loved that as a social endeavor, that you go to work every day and um, see the same people and sit down and joke with them and try to invent stories. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, at the same time, by the time the end came, I had had enough. Uh, I wasn't miserable, but it was just right. That's a, let's quit now. Does your passion for the writing drop for the later seasons? Like if you had the same energy no, you had for five, no, it's it, it, it only increased, I think. It only increased in that... Um, um, responsibility now at this point. Well, we, 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 it was harder and harder to do because we had used up all the easy stuff we had to keep going and we had to come up with new feelings, at least new, new somethings. And, and I really enjoyed that. The other thing was that I was working with Terrence winter and he was very, very good. He still is, but on the Sopranos, he was very, very good. And I felt that though I was the boss. I needed to keep up with him or do better than him. But that's an evil, that's a bad way of saying it. What I felt when I read his stuff was, this is really good. I, I'm inspired. Let's go. At, let's, let's do it once more. Did you always know you wanted the last episode? Because obviously you're the creator, you did the pilot, and then you directed and wrote the, the last episode as well. Was there ever a party that goes, this show's become bigger than me now, am I definitely the man to close this out? Or how do credits work? Like when it says David Chase and Terrence Winter on certain episodes, is there still a writing team behind certain things and it's just the, the, the most contribution who gets the credit or do you actually take a blank script and go, right, series four, episode three, this is my responsibility, start to finish every piece of dialogue you're writing? Okay, here's how it worked on The Sopranos. Uh, at the end of any given season, my wife and I would go away to France for four months, let's say. And toward the end of the third month or beginning of the fourth, I would really start to think seriously about the following season. And I would set myself the task of making up the story of that season. Okay, from episode one through 13, here's what Tony is gonna go through, okay? That would all be written down. And toward the end, there would be two or three Tony lines because he was doing many things. There'd be a Tony and Carmela line. Um, then Carmela, what is she going through? One through 13. Christopher, what is he doing? One through 13. So that would give you the whole, the se and all the kids, everybody. That would give you the season arc, the story of that season. Then I would get back to New York and I'd show this to the writers and we'd put it on the wall. And then we'd start to, sh to work out each, um, each episode, the story within each episode. And within each episode, we would usually have three to four stories. There'd be a Tony story, which would complete what Tony would have said on the big graph, what Tony was supposed to happen, or two Tony stories, I'm saying a Carmela story, maybe a Chris story, maybe a Paulie story, that would comprise an episode. That would then be assigned to a writer to do, this, to do the teleplay. Okay. And when you're, when you're talking about kind of idea generation from yourself creatively, do you find the writer's room and the kind of brainstorming element is the place where the best ideas happen or is it something that kind of nearly happens in the shower when you're lying in bed that you found that, this is what Tony should do next, or this is a, a clever angle occurs from a kind of light bulb point of view as a writer. Well, the shower is a, um, no pun, is it? like a fountain of ideas. The shower in the morning is always yeah. good. 
or ideas, but I would then bring them into the into the writer's room. Um, I would have to say, I really enjoyed the writer's room and I got a lot of ideas there. But the writers, most of the writers did not come up with story elements. And it usually fell to me to invent most of the story. Now, um, I used, that used to annoy me, that fact. Um, however, it has occurred to me lately, looking back on it, that maybe the reason they didn't advance any ideas, they, I'm not saying any, but they didn't advance too many ideas, was that I said no to all of them. No, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to do that so that they stopped trying. That might have been the case. Was that a possession thing over your creation or was it genuinely because you... Uh, I didn't, didn't feel... Think they understood the character. I would feel that what they were suggesting was not right. That it had to be better than that or different than that. You see it with a lot of great sports teams and it's kind of comparable in the team aspect that sometimes the most successful um, and consistent have dressing rooms in which there's a leader who does to an extent lead with an iron fist. Would you say that you were tough to work for on the Sopranos? And that's what kind of made it so consistent, so brilliant that it wasn't all kind of uh, arm around the shoulder stuff happening on set. What I'm saying must sound extremely uh, conceited, self aggrandizing, but I do believe that that's sort of how it went. You know, we would sit there talking about ideas and, and, and also, in every writer, maybe not, see, I've never been in another show's writer room, but there was a lot of bullshit. Mm. And it was fun just talking about anything. Um, and often, an idea would come out of that conversation. Not often enough, but often. Just out of the conversation, somebody talking about his uncle, holy cow, there's a, there's a story or an, a story element. Um. But yet I don't recall my colleagues coming up with things that we should do or being inspired to say, here's, here's an episode for us. I don't remember that. And they would keep, we'd all be bullshitting. And then I'd look at the clock and I'd see that the day was almost gone. And I would move away from them and go lie down on a the couch. They would continue talking about what they were talking about. And I'd try to think up what should go on the, the storyboard next. And I used to I used to think, well, that's just the way it is. They're just they're gonna let me do it all. But maybe I'm thinking lately, they didn't come up with any ideas because when they did, they got a no. Don't get me wrong, these are all really talented people. They wrote they wrote scripts episodic scripts that were fantastic and I'm sure as they look back they would say what he's saying is horrible I could kill him for that um, but I believe I'm, tr I'm trying to portray it and be truthful to my memory all right apologies for that um, not good enough from anybody involved so I'd like to apologize again, and I'm as pissed off as you, so let's just be pissed off together. Um, when it comes to the... Let me just say something first. I just want to make clear that it's understood that I sound very uh, old. I think I said was conceited or uh, self-congratulatory. Um, I want to repeat that these were the best writers in the business. They were great. And maybe the dynamic of the room is the reason that they didn't come up with more story. Although some of them did. Terry did. Matt did occasionally. Um, and then others never did. So would you, have had a, would you have had a heavy writing involvement in every episode that ever aired? Yes. Yeah, because that's what I was thinking. When you look at some shows, like obviously <clears throat> a much different genre, when there's things like The Simpsons, 
and you have different writers for different episodes, how do you keep the dialogue consistent? Because dialogue is the observation of how people speak from one person's brain. I never understood how a show can have different writers for episodes and you can have someone say the same things. Well, what do you mean you have people say the same thing? Like the way Tony Soprano, the way he spoke to Meadow, let's say, uh-huh. or AJ, it has the same prose, the same tone, the right. same kind of right. words used. That, that can only come from one mind. 20 different people can't write that dialogue for, for different episodes. We had five, I think. Um, and that's a big part of the talent, is that you are able to write in the voice of the characters of that show. You know, I mean, if you may be the top writer on uh, Sons of Anarchy because you can sound like those guys, but you could come to The Sopranos or Sex in the City and not be able to cut it. But that's usually not what happens. Usually writers, successful writers are good at, it makes it sound like I'm talking about copying, but it isn't. It's they're good at inhabiting all types of people. And I mean inhabiting. Is it ever emotionally exhausting in terms of uh, from like an identity point of view when you have to speak in someone else's voice, not just to write it, not just to think it up, but then to watch it so many times when it comes to takes and just be so focused on, on mythical characters that at the end of the day are fiction? Do you ever lose yourself in it? And as part of writing nearly a want to lose yourself that never happens because let's say uh, uh, two lines of dialogue come out of you and you write them down and then they are sent to the set and actors speak them and put their heart and soul put their soul into it and directors work with that so there's a lot of soul going into it and then when you see it on the screen when you see it uh, in dailies, it's very, it's alive. It's not yours anymore. Yeah, it's not, yeah. You don't go like, oh, there's my uh, you know. yeah. It's, it's, there's Tony Soprano, is what you say. How important was James Gandolfini being Tony Soprano? Now looking back on it, to to him being uh, that alive in, in in people's living rooms as they watched. He, it. he was of paramount importance. We didn't. We weren't. Paramount was in our studio. But he was he was of paramount importance. He brought so much to it. Um, some of it he brought intentionally. Some of it it just came. But he was there. I don't. There would have been no Sopranos without some other actor, without Jim. For years, you didn't really comment on what happened to Tony Soprano in the end, um, like whether or not he was alive or dead. And obviously, people like to fantasize about that and and uh, make up their own outcomes but as part of the reason that you didn't do it is because you didn't really appreciate how much they wanted to see his demise you didn't want to give them that that's why the screen went to black you didn't want to see them see tony find his kind of justice for his hypocrisy i still don't i, I still don't say what happened to tony soprano um will you die with that secret i, I really don't know yes i i, I was not I was not in favor of that hypocrisy. Um, but you know what? The ending is the ending. It's been discussed ad nauseum. And either you're there for it or you're not. The show ended in 07. Do you, do you have to talk about The Sopranos every day in some way, shape, or form? You can't go out for a coffee without talking about The Sopranos. I mean, I probably wind up mentioning The Sopranos once a day let me think is that true no but if I, like recently i went i saw a friends friends of mine from high school and i talked a lot about the sopranos because they were talking about it so um and of course i love to hear people say they appreciate it and i love to hear when people bring something to the party that is they say something about what they saw about a scene or a or an episode or whatever that expands the meaning of it. You know, the varsity athlete scene when uh, Tony Soprano storms out of the the dinner because his uh, uncle claims he never had the makings to be a varsity athlete. Right. For me, that portrays his insecurities 
as well as any scene in the entire series. Well, that that piece of dialogue comes from my life. My my uncle Dave told my girl cousins that I would never be a varsity athlete. And did it annoy you as much as uh, you could see James Gandolfini be annoyed in that scene? No, no, it didn't. I didn't care. I really didn't care to be a varsity athlete. But, you know, it, it, I was I first heard that when I was maybe 12, and I, got, I guess I was upset and hurt. But um, it is funny how many people love that varsity athlete thing. I, I don't know why, but they do. Um, it's, I just guess so, it's just so entertaining to see a guy who has so much responsibility that involves mortality, care about such a menial issue. And the conflict of that kind of, in a way, sums up Tony Soprano yeah. as much yeah, as anything. You're right. It is like that. It's just fascinating when you think about uh, the concept of little things like that in life that ex- that you experience becoming so important by just kind of remembering them yeah. and, and well, putting them into something. A friend, mine, a friend of mine in high school and in, at college age, and we both played in this band together. He said, uh, we were hanging around at a party somewhere, um, and he said, um, remember when is the lowest form of conversation. And he was really being a dick when he said it. It kind of was, you know, put a wet blanket on whatever was going on. And I put that in the show. And people just say it all the time now to me. And... Um, he's passed away, but if he knew that his his opinion was now known throughout the world, I, yeah. I wonder what he would think. Do you ever get kind of um, carried away with um, how impactful you've been? Like to have, as I said, like just a, a throwaway conversation with a mate you were in a band with years ago to become a a worldwide quote. Do you ever get scared of nearly how important your brain has been to, to modern culture? Get scared? No. Proud, fearful? Proud. Yeah, proud, but mainly amused. Uh, kind of incredulous. But not fearful, no. When, when kind of things of such, in a way, unimportance become so important to other people, do you nearly begin to view the general public as uh, easily amused or nearly lacking uh, lacking no. enough meaning? I find them very difficult to amuse. you got to really work hard um, to amuse humanity. You have to really work hard and give them something different and give them come in from some side they weren't expecting. It's very difficult. It's fun, especially when it works. Amusing humanity is something you just always wanted to do. You talked about being in a band there earlier. It's just something you kind of couldn't have lived, lived without. Is that the case? I guess that's the case. I mean, yeah, I wanted to be in a band very badly. Uh, and we had a band, although we never played, we never played a, a, a professional date. Um, uh, there were several, let's say there was a group of 12 guys. There were several bands within that 12 different it would come together in different shapes with different people. Mm. Um, and it was a lot of fun, but we, what I do regret is that we never really took the steps that would have made it become important. What were the steps? You just weren't committed enough to the music or? I don't know. I just, I mean, if you look at, if you look at just, okay, the Stones, for example, I mean, you know, these two guys came from Dartmoor and um, you met Brian Jones from Cheltenham Spa and they really worked at it. They lived together and they went at it and went at it and went at it. And as soon as they started being able to play somewhere, they took those gigs and they played them and played them and played them. I think about it, the Richmond train station and this and that. And we didn't do that. We didn't. It's like we were, we thought we were so cool that we were saving ourselves. Um, we were going to keep working on it and save ourselves for when the time was right. 
and we didn't work hard enough on it. And there was a lot of uh, dissension within the band, uh, ego problems, which happens in every band, I guess. Mm. But um, with us, it happened early on. I find with many writers that I've spoken to, it, it, the kind of creative dream always started out with the want to be in a band. Is that because it's the art form that appeals most because it's, it's quick, it's noisy, it's in your face? Or is it because being a live performing musician who's expressing himself via song is in a way the highest art form? Uh, I think it's closer to that. I don't know that it's the... I think it feels better yeah. to the artist than any, than any other art form. To be playing an instrument or doing a vocal and with three or four other people and you hit a groove, it's like, it's, it's just so exciting and so delightful. It's such a physically great feeling. That's me talking. I'm someone who really doesn't know what it's like. Is it, uh, did you ask Stephen Van Zant this? He, he could tell you. When you talk about the kind of adrenaline that expression gives you, writing, although exciting, it's very long term. Do you ever get that explosion? Like, would you ever rewatch a Sopranos episode and get and get that adrenaline? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it the same as as actually finding a groove in music? Because finding a groove in music is happening in the present tense. Watching something good on the Sopranos is that's happening in the past. There's a, there's an element of because there's only so many notes possible to the human ear. When you kind of find that groove, when you're all in sync. It's actually not artificial on any level. It's real human connection. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, we're using the the possibilities of sound to just be on the same page here. It's like we're all moving up at, uh, simultaneously. It's fantastic. Did you ever consider acting in a serious way? In a serious way? No, yeah. I I used to want to be an actor or a movie star, but I never pursued it. Why? Um, I just didn't think I was good looking enough. And then when you saw the cast of Sopranos, did you think what a bullshit thought that was? No, by that time, well, by that time, that good looking thought was over. But, um, but when I was like 11, 12, 13, um, and I didn't understand it. I didn't understand acting. And then later in life, I took an acting class. And then again, I wished I had really done it because when you're in a scene and you hit a groove in that scene, that was very close to LSD as far as I'm concerned. But I I don't know what that's like. Does that happen all day long? How many times can that happen uh, if you're an actor? Yeah. And also, do you ever then feel guilty when you see two actors thinking they've hit that groove and you didn't like the take as director and they've after emotionally pouring themselves into the camera and you're saying, go again? No, I know. I've never felt guilty about that. Did you like the experience of LSD? Well, I repeated it. So I guess there was something I liked. Um, I found it extremely exciting and transcendent, let's say that. It didn't give me clarity or truth. I mean, I wouldn't go into it. I would say it was transcendent. That's all. Uh, until I took, until I had, a, I had a bad trip, and that was the end of that. Never again. Bad trip in terms of it just felt like the end is is around the corner, and the, um, my psyche's betraying no, no, no. myself. In particular, I became possessed of a particular fear uh, about a particular monster or person. A living person that was a monster. I, uh, I became possessed by that, and I couldn't forget about it. Like and a living, a living person from your past. Night. I ruined everyone else's night too. You ruined their night. Like a living person from your past, though. Just, just no, 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 no. What was going on then? It was there was some stuff in the paper going on, and I forgot. I began. To, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Mur- actually, murders, and I kept thinking that that murderer was going to come to our house. And the more... Who, what, do you remember what murderer it was? Yeah, I just don't want to talk about it. Charles Manson, Ted Bundy? No, uh, no, no. I'm not going to say. Fascinating, though. 
You see, I'm not going to say because I guess I'm still kind of afraid of it. Would there still be fears, even with someone of your life experience and someone who's gone through so many emotions? Is there still shit that keeps you awake at night? Do you become more fearless with age? You know, I worry about my family members, my child, my wife. Uh, I worry about them a lot. Um, And I worry, uh, yes, and and mortality. I think about mortality quite a bit, the older I get. How have you found money as a uh, friend in life? It was as important as I thought it would be. So you, you don't buy the whole money can't buy happiness bullshit? It's true that money can't buy happiness. But you're better off having money while you're unhappy than not. You know, you can hire somebody to take you from point A to point B driving through the traffic yourself that's just an example that's kind of a joke but that's but that is what i mean it buys you ease and you know when you when you talk about things like the idea of therapy being so important to the sopranos you were very much ahead of your time as somebody who even valued especially as a man in the world 40 50 years ago the concept of counseling or talking to someone about your mental health why do you think that uh you knew to do that as opposed to kind of just put it into shame like so many people of that generation did? Um, Well, I don't know, but at the age of 13 or so, I'd say, I became very interested in the subject of Sigmund Freud and read about him as as much as I could or could understand because I was interested in the human brain, I guess. And... So I knew about psychotherapy way back. And I knew that I needed something. I knew that um, unlike my mother, for example, who was unaware of how skewed she was, I wasn't. Uh, I had things and fears, mostly fears that I knew had to be dealt with in some way. So would you subscribe to the Freudian concept nearly of the, of the Oedipus complex? There's probably some truth to it, yeah. But does it always play out? I don't think so. It's been fascinating to talk to, to somebody who's provided so much for us uh, in terms of entertainment. Well, you're quite welcome. Thank you for having me. It's been how many years, my oh, boy? Audio book, started. Short and you audio still books. don't know my chairs of joy. No need to go, just take Radio it slow. Podcast. And have you heard the Michael Anthony show? I show. Makes me feel just fine. What's the help of the Makes me see the light. What about those tears? Cheers. Leave my eyes. How's it make a fair? Makes me feel 